and it'll immediately start recording. And then, uh, like you say, give them maybe 30 seconds. Recording in progress. All right. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. I wanted to thank you for joining the AO Trauma Hand North America Online Series. This is a series that we just started this year called the Three Cases Fireside Series. The topic today will be on thumb ulnar collateral ligament injuries, treating the athlete versus the weekend warrior. So really want to thank Dr. Marco Rizzo, who's been the chair of the AO North America Hand Education Committee for all his Tyler's work and put into the curriculum. We've had quite, quite a few exciting lineups coming up with vir both virtual and also live courses. Uh, Dr. Rizzo is the chair of Division of Hand Surgery, the Mayo Clinic. So really thank Dr. Rizzo for all his work um, on making all the educational offerings happen. So really excited to have a fantastic faculty lineup this evening. Uh, I'm going to be moderating. My name is Jerry Horn from the University of Washington, Seattle, Washington. And our sage, so our uh, sage with the wisdom and years of experience will be Dr. Thomas Hunt from Arizona Sports Medicine Center in Scottsdale, Arizona. And our expert faculty will be Dr. Kevin Plancher from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, New York. And to really kind of enlighten us and guide us on therapy will be Kim McVeigh. She's the Director of Rehab and Operational Manager at the Mayo Clinic at Jacksonville of Florida. These are the financial disclosures for the faculty here. As far as the overall agenda and the program, I'm um, going to be starting with overall evaluation and treatment of thumb UCL injuries and pose the faculty with a case. And then Dr. Hunt will talk about how he treats these injuries, his treatment algorithm for acute and chronic injuries, and how he assesses the ligamentous structure as far as what to do with these. Dr. Plancher will talk to us about thumb UCL injuries and more specifically, navigating complications. And Kim McVeigh will be discussing the therapy and post-op rehab process after thumb UCL surgery and repair. We're going to follow that with a Q&A session with the panelists, also case discussion as well. Uh, as far as CME credit, uh, AO North America is accredited by the ACGME. And you will, um, for the entire series, the Fireside series, you'll be receiving a maximum of 11.25 Category 1 credits. Uh, so you will get a link with a questionnaire about 24 hours after the series. So just kind of be on the lookout for that in your email box. Um, AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty the society that's dedicated to improvement of care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. And so we do not endorse or promote any use of any products or services for a specific commercial entity. Um, just so the attendees, all your microphones have been muted, video cameras are turned off. So any questions you have for the faculty, please use the Q&A box. So as you type the questions in there, the faculty will be answering them um, kind of as they come through the boxes. And in between the lectures, also in the Q&A session, we'll try and answer some of the questions live as well. And we'll kind of go through the questions one by one as they pop up. As far as the overall learning objectives, not so much for this specific presentation, but for the fireside series, is to be able to identify clinical indications and radiographic indications for surgical procedures, talk about some of the criteria for each of the surgical procedures described, define the anatomy of surgical steps, and recognizing pitfalls and complications, and go over the relevant literature for each of the procedures to be discussed. So hope you've been able to join us for each of the sessions throughout this uh, academic year. Have a really great series so far. Uh, so we're on series number five or session number five. But quite a few left later on the year, metacarpal fractures, brachial plexus injuries, dysteratus malunion, and DREJ. Uh, a couple of live courses coming up. Hopefully you'll have a chance to join us for some of the live courses. There's one coming up in September in Dallas, Texas, uh, chaired by Dr. Kim Zira. There's an advanced risk summits uh, 
that's going to be chaired by Dr. Rizzo and Dr. Mazira coming up in Clearwater, Florida as well. So certainly be on the lookout um, through the AO website for upcoming courses. A couple more online events. Again, really want to acknowledge Marco for everything he's done, but we have a couple of webinars coming up August 2nd and November 1st as well. And uh, there will be a link to the recording sent out to the attendees afterwards for those that have registered for the course as well. From that, I'm going to stop share briefly and go into my other talk here. All right, I want to welcome everybody again. Uh, my name is Jerry Juan from the University of Washington, Seattle, University of Washington, Seattle. And the topic today will be on thumb UCL injuries, treating the athlete to the weekend warrior. These are my disclosures. So as you know, these are very common injuries, uh, oftentimes called a skier's thumb. Uh, second most common ski injury just next to a knee sprain, oftentimes with ACL injury. We tell patients this is from a fall on while you're holding a ski pole with a forced abduction and extension of the thumb MCP joint. This is def very different than a gamekeeper thumb, which is more of a traditional rupture. So with a acute thumb UCL injury, you usually have an acute avulsion of the UCL off either the proximal phalanx or more proximal alpha metacarpal neck. Very different from more of a chronic attritional rupture of the UCL. Uh, it certainly happened from other injuries other than ski injuries, very common in volleyball. Certainly treated quite a few football players and basketball players with this injury as well. Again, that's that forced abduction moment on the thumb MCP joint. Oftentimes, it's important to recognize you have a combined injury, not just a thumb on a collateral ligament complex, but also volar play oftentimes with hyperextension instability, as well as injuries to dorsal MCP joint capsule as well. Path the pathoanatomy, it's usually a ligamentous injury, avulsion off the base of P1 about 90% of the time. You can, especially on a high, really high energy mechanism, you can get a missed substance injury. Fat patients with both a proximal and a distal avulsion as well at the same time. We talk about a standard lesion, in which case the UCL is actually displaced, so it's sitting superficial to the adductor aponeurosis, in which case a healing response cannot occur without a surgical repair. It's also really important to make the distinction between the Q rupture and a more attritional rupture, such as a true gamekeeper thumb. Surgical exposure, we'll talk about some of the complications later on the webinar today. Uh, I tell the residents and fellows, as you're making your incision, it's really important to keep in mind the radial sensory nerve is going to be running uh, essentially parallel to your thumb UCL. So um, you want to get that protected. It's size the adductor aponeurosis, just volar to thumb extensor. So people have described the S incision. I actually like to go curvilinear, just following that, that volar curve on the MCP joint just to avoid injury to the radial sensory nerve branches. Be aware of the radial sensory nerve. Oftentimes, once you get it out of the way, you'll see complete disruption of the adductor aponeurosis and a thumb UCL that's been retracted back quite a bit. Suture anchor repairs really become the mainstay for our treatment of these injuries. And Dr. Han will go over this in a lot more detail as far as how he treats this and his preferred treatment technique for different clinical scenarios. Uh, this is a patient with a uh, clear, um, clearly fully disrupted thumb UCL. Uh, this is a, a intraoperative stress test and post repair with restoration of the owner stability over the MCP joint. There are cases where you go in there, especially on the older patient on a chronic injury, where the native ACL is completely gone. You really don't have a remnant to work with. You really can't do an acute repair. There are different uh, techniques described for a thumb UCL reconstruction. This is an example of a kind of a bone tunnel technique using a Palmaris tendon graft. Uh, different reconstructions have been described. Steve Lee talked about different reconstructions, but reconstruction number one is the one that's probably the most anatomic. So you're looking at two bone tunnels at the base of the proximal phalanx with a bigger bone tunnel of the metacarpal neck to try and restore the anatomic, both the proper and the uh, accessory collateral ligament on the ulnar aspect. Uh, this example of kind of intraoperative uh, photos, courtesy of Dr. Uh, Jeff Yao, looking at this technique. Uh, bone tunnels about five millimeters apart. Uh, you could use a 2.5 or a three millimeter bone tunnel. It's important to have a converger drill guide cleaning out the uh, tunnel really nicely with the curette. But I would argue that something to think about, you know, thumb MCP joint, it's a hinge joint, was in some ways stability is much more important than mobility. 
So I think you'd be aware if you're looking at doing multiple revisions of a failed thumb UCL repair. This is my uh, partner, Doug Cano, who talks about who needs a thumb MCP joint as far as motion. That's his thumb on the far right, uh, showing he's got about 10, maybe 20 degrees arc of motion. That's just fine. So we're going to touch about some of the more modern techniques and kind of the rehab process. Dr. Hung will talk about this as well as Kim McVeigh. Uh, this is one of my good friends, Steve Shin. Uh, if you haven't read this article, he was featured in an article talking about the billion dollar hand surgeon. So quite a few prominent athletes with thumb UCL injuries treated with a internal bracing technique. Uh, Mike Trout, Chris Paul, Drew Brees are some of the more prominent athletes. So this is kind of a newer technique that's been popularized by Steve Shin and Dr. Hunt will talk about this as well. When cases where the thumb UCL is not the best condition, it's attenuated, maybe it's a more chronic injury. You could actually take a thumb UCL repair and augment it with a supplemental suture tape on top of it. This is a biomechanical study showing that an intact UCL compared to a repair compared to augmented repair, you can see a much better stiffness with an augmented repair with suture taping. So case series early on of 18 athletes returned to play at a mean of 30 days in the middle of the season. So really just four weeks out instead of your traditional three month of being out of sports and out of return to play. In this clinical series, they talked about this being a much faster recovery process, accelerated rehab with no failures with 18 patients. We looked at our kind of case series here at University of Washington. It's important to recognize complications can happen. 105 surgeries, 104 patients by my junior partners, uh, Dr. Ian Nuzzi and others. And they actually found 25% of patients did have incisional numbness, about 8% neuropraxia, mainly the radial sensory nerve. And there were five patients that have failed surgery requiring revision. So really important to keep that in mind and have the discussion with the patient preoperatively. This is an example of a patient that um, has six weeks postoperatively was doing quite well with a very stable MCP joint, but has severe hypersensitivity right over the thumb MCP joint, right along the radial sensory nerve distribution, likely consistent with a possible neuroma of the radial sensory nerve. So the question becomes, what do you do for these exploration? Do you do a neurolysis? Oftentimes it's just scar tissue on top. If you have a true injury over the radial sensory nerve, you're looking at some type of neuroma management. And there are certainly options out there, including RPNI, versus more of a TMR technique or relocation more proximally. So overall, it is a very successful surgery. I think a Q thumb steel repair, certainly a very satisfying surgery. Most patients do do quite well. Some of the newer techniques, including internal bracing, maybe a faster rehab and more reliable repair. Recons can be effective for certain patients, but be aware of bone tunnels. And Dr. Plancher will talk about some of the complications as well, but injury to the radial sensory nerve is real and can happen. So now I'll kind of leave it with this case. You have a 20-year-old male college basketball player came in with acute injury, pain, swelling of the thumb, MCP joint, on relaxed with no endpoint. What's the best surgical technique and what are possible complications that you have to make sure that you discuss with the patient preoperatively? And from that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hunt from there. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That was that was a fantastic start and a great introduction. And and um, I'll get my slides up here and hopefully get going. How's that look? Looks good. You see it? Good. So it's uh, my name's Tom Hunt, and it's a real pleasure to be able to be the sage, quote unquote, for this for this talk. This is one particular injury that is probably my favorite injury to treat. I think you know it's people tend to be really happy you tend to get them back quickly and the complications though there are those that are present are are relatively few and far between i think one of the complications i think of mostly is stiffness and that's when we think about more rigid structures like internal braces um being need, needing to be put in appropriately but my comments in this uh, brief talk really are related to those complete ligament disruptions like you see above, those that have retracted and therefore require uh, surgical treatment. I have no conflicts related to this particular presentation and my, my goals really are to define the algorithms of care for both acute and chronic thumb ulnar collateral ligament injuries in low and mid-demand individuals and athletes 
especially in comparison to those that are more high demand professional elite athletes. I think it's important that we learn how to know when and how to most appropriately and most effectively utilize this really great technology, the internal brace technology, and also understand the indications and procedures for the use of autograph tissue and the treatment of chronic injuries, as, as Jerry um, mentioned uh, briefly. So the primary determinants of care, we know injury characteristics, but also patient needs. Like we already talked about this particular quarterback. Here he is in the playoffs, losing control of, of his uh, ball, even though he has a great reconstruction by a fantastic surgeon. And I think there are things that we may not fully understand um, or sacrifices that may occur when we return people just in two games like was the case for Drew. Um, they may be related to, um, you know, the, the integrity at the repair, the stiffness, the amount of tissue present, and whether uh, an internal brace in this particular uh, player's situation impacted somehow that repair situation. You, you just really don't know. And I think there's a lot, a lot to learn, but we're obviously pushed quite a bit by the patient needs and, and particular desires. So when I look at acute injuries, so for me, that's a primary repair and reinsertion. I certainly won't go through that technique. I think most of you probably already know that, but this is, these are, this is a technique that I utilize really in cases of isolated trauma, those that have an avulsion fracture, especially if they're skeletally immature, as you see in the bottom left picture, uh, first time injuries, mid substance tears. I tend not to add internal braces for those and the low or mid-demand athlete. And what I mean by that are athletes that really are at minimal risk for re-injury. So we'll talk about some that are at risk for repeated injuries and those in those situations, probably more than a simple primary repair and reinsertion is required. And also the low demand typically can allow for some period of the mobilization. So, if we're looking at acute injuries um, in this population of people where you have um, additional trauma, for example, like I can recall a, a, not a professional athlete, but a woman who tore on their collateral ligament, similar to what you see on the top left there, and also tore a ligament in her contralateral small finger PIP joint, which required surgical treatment. Well, in that case, additional trauma, you'd like to help the rehab and you'd like to add some additional support. And that's an indication for an internal brace. Revision surgeries, certainly in the subacute setting, Jerry mentioned a couple of instances of that. Uh, that's important when there's good residual ligament. And we know that an internal brace can be a value, especially in a high demand elite athlete like Drew Brees or somebody of that uh, sort. But it's really dependent on the sport. It's dependent on the position, the timing in the season, and everything that goes into it. And with these guys, there's a lot that goes into it. So if we move on, we start to think a little bit more about chronic injuries, um, or sometimes they're acute on chronic, but really a situation where uh, the ligament's torn, it's retracted, and it's been retracted for quite some time, which is very common, especially in the NFL players I treat, because if the injury occurs during the season, we wait till the end of the season to fix them. Well, oftentimes, that re that ligament is retracted, scarred into a little ball, and you have to figure out how to deal with that. But just on a, a quick side note, I've had several players, uh, NFL players, who um, have had complete disruptions proven by um, physical exam and, and MRI waited to the end of the season for uh, surgery, and at the end of the season had perfect, stable thumbs. So um, so it does happen. But anyway, often in this situation, it's a matter of defining the ligament for me, uh, reforming it, repairing it, and then adding a re an internal brace for um, help. So this is an example of an NFL offensive guard. I'm kind of pushing on the ligament, um, and you can see – it's kind of glistening white there, right there where I was pushing. And you can see when we stress it, it really opens up. So it's obviously torn, retracted, proximally, a fairly classic stenor lesion. And what we're doing is we're trying to define that retracted proximal ligament, which is now 
kind of flipped behind and over the adductor aponeurosis, which is distal in this um, in this video. And you'll see us cutting through this right here and and starting to define the um, adductor aponeurosis, cutting through it, and then defining the capsule uh, proximally and, and distally. And in my view, in this situation, it's really worth taking the time to define that proximal retracted ligament. Because in most every case, I can um, cut the scar tissue, redefine the ligament, and uh, turn it into a functional ligament. And to me, that's that's much better than, than adding a graft, given that you have uh, vascular inflow approximately, and you have potential for reestablishment of proprioception, potential nerve endings, et cetera. So, so I think it's a value. So here we're, we've gone through the adductor apneurosis, where we've gone through the capsule, and you can see the forceps are on this kind of thick tissue right there. I'm grabbing it right there. And that's the kind of pseudo ligament that's formed. And I think that's probably the material when in pro when it's in a proper location accounts for those few people I mentioned that at the end of the season will all of a sudden have excellent stability. So here I'm just progressing along and, and taking time and, and uh, really trying to define that proximal retracted ball of scar tissue and defining the ligamentous uh, components. And, and you can start to see, you can start to see the, um, the uh, collagen fibers, it looks a little whiter. And um, and it's a matter of just kind of keep working through it. And so you're in this situation and you just continually have to um, find. But now you can see that that ligament is starting to come into view. Its origin is intact on the met metacarpal. And um, in just a minute, we'll finish releasing the scar tissue. And, um, and you'll see the ligaments uh, ready to go. To here now, it's it's completely um, reformed and, and ready for for uh, repair. So now here we are, same person. So we're going to put an internal brace in as well. So we've got proximal and we've got distal drill holes, and the proximal and the metacarpal we want to be just dorsal to the um, equator, and the distal drill hole, you want to be just lower to the equator. I think in this particular situation, the volar uh, K-wire and drill hole is a little bit, little bit too lower. But here now, uh, um, an anchor has been placed in distally, and you can see in that anchor, there's a fiber wire suture was being, which is being used to repair that, that reformed, um, previously retracted ulnar collateral ligament. You can also see that there's a, a suture tape that will be used and laid over the top of the ligament um, after the repair is complete. And when we think about repairing these ligaments, it's it's not a simple repair back to the anatomic insertion site to me. It's creating a, a stable box configuration. So you'll see that after we get this stitch in and we tie this down, we're going to repair the dorsal tissues, the dorsal capsule down to the dorsal aspect of the ligament, and really try and create that stable box for the ulnar side of the joint. So you can see the thumb's positioned appropriately, about 30 degrees of flexion, corrected in terms of its um, radial deviation. Then the repair occurs, it's tightened, and now we're just, again, repairing those dorsal tissues that I referenced. And as soon as that is complete, and we feel like we've really uh, repaired the, the anatomic tissues as well as possible, then the internal brace goes over the top. And the question is, how tight do you put in the internal brace? So when you're taught this procedure initially, at least when I was taught it, I was I was cautioned not to put it in too tight to the point where it was almost as if you'd put an instrument under the, the suture tape when you placed it down on top of the ligaments. And, and I think that can cause some problems, and you'll see an example of that in a minute. 
but it's important to have an appropriate tension, um, not so much that it prevents your underlying ligament from seeing tension and experiencing force, because we know that um, ligaments heal more quickly and more completely from a histological and biomechanical standpoint if they see stress, if they see some force. So if you had a, a an internal brace over the top of this that was just so tight, the ligament never experienced any kind of uh, stress, the chances are that the, the, re, the um, reformation of the ligament wouldn't be quite as impactful as effective. So here we're putting the um, suture tape into the ligament, into the metacarpal bone. Oh, and you see that anchor being placed. And you see how tight the, the suture tape is. It's not, it wasn't pulled very tight, but it also wasn't left loose at all. So that's that. So thank you for sitting through this. So um, now sometimes we have chronic injuries like we just saw, but we'll go in and we see no evidence of ligament. It, it just didn't there. And um and uh, Jerry was mentioning the fact that utilizing a palmaris longus graft can be effective. And I really attribute this to Steve Glickle. He's the one that talked about this originally. And this is a uh, picture from uh, a book that um, Jerry and I edited. But you can see in this situation, utilizing that tendon graft in the way Jerry kind of already explained, and then putting perhaps an internal brace over the top of it, uh, at times is what I tend to utilize. And this is especially valuable for a, an elite athlete, a real high demand athlete. I can recall a, um, an NFL center who I, op who had had the reconstruction once, a simple repair. I then treated him a second time, figuring my re repair would be better. Well, it was not. Uh, with his hand in the dirt, he sustained another injury. And this is finally what I, I went to, and he's done well ever since that. So I think it's something that in the situation where you can't reform the ligament and you need to put in some um, biological tissue, then this is this is a good, effective way to accomplish that. This is a case, though, where somebody didn't really do that. So this is a, a recreational but very good tennis player a female, and you can see prior to her original index procedure on the uh, left, you can see her thumb, and apparently it was loose, and so for that reason, she went to surgery um, six weeks after the original injury, and the ligament was retracted, and the surgeon just resected the ligament, um, put in an internal brace, and used a palmaris longus onlay autograft. And I think the difference between using an onlay type of autograft and the glycol type of graft that both Jerry and I showed is that with the glycol graft, you're able to generate tension. You're able to pull the fibers tightly and it's simply more tissue. So six weeks uh, or six months after the original procedure, she was very unstable, painful. And these are the x-rays you see there on the right. And you can see the the holes utilized for the various anchors. Here's her video at the time of surgery there on the left. You can see the joint is subluxated when we kind of push it back into position. You can see that it comes back in and you can see the internal brace down there very loose. So obviously not placed in a position that was effective. And also there was no tissue. So the palmaris longus graft was nowhere to be found. Um, and then what we did in this particular case is we actually didn't put any new biological tissue in. We replaced the um, internal brace and added a all suture anchor into the proximal hole in the metacarpal and brought it to now a second small hole with the push lock in the in the base of the um, proximal phalanx. We can talk about that more if you like, but that was a salvage procedure trying to use everything on the shelf. And this was her outcome about six months later. And you can see uh, she had um, good function and ended up with uh, good motion, a very happy patient. So summary thoughts, 
Internal braces are a great technological advance. There's no question about it. And they've really helped us in multiple ways many times. However, they're not required for all cases. And they're not without their own issues, as you just saw in that last case. They're especially valuable in the high demand patients and athletes. Um, chronic injuries, are there. I think they're very valuable. And also, especially in revisions, uh, they can be helpful in conjunction with autograft. And we've talked about um, the various kinds of autograft. So the other thing to keep in mind is to restore and reconstruct and repair chronically retracted ligaments, stenter lesions. Don't just give up and, and put in a tendon graft. You're going to be, I think, happier with the time you took to reconstruct these retracted ligaments, given the quality of the tissue and the vascularity. But if you do need to uh, obtain autograft and there just simply isn't the tissue, consider using the tensioned type autograft, the glycal type graft that we discussed, as opposed to an onlay graft, which is often discussed um, elsewhere. And also, as evidenced by that last case, just know your implant options, your plan B, C, and D. And um, often you'll probably find yourself there. So that's it. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you all. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. That was fantastic. Really appreciate the pros. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. Uh, for the attendees, please keep the questions coming on the Q&A. This is a great time to put the questions in there for Dr. Hunt. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Plancher give his talk next to give his thoughts on Thumb ECL as the expert uh, faculty, also managing complications. Thank you. Well, good evening. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Thumbs up. And thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Marco and Rizzo and everyone out there. I'm Kevin Plancher from New York. Not sure... I will let the gang decide who's the expert, but I'd like to share uh, now with you uh, managing complications and some thoughts about on the collateral ligaments. We've had two great uh, introductions and talks, and I hope not to repeat some of those things. So remember, as uh, Tom said, Dr. Dunn said, 86% of all athletic injuries are there. The difference between an acute, uh, which is in contact and non-contact sports, very predominant in the skier's thumb, as you heard, and in football and the chronic, they are very different. Um, an attenuation of ligament under repeated stress, the gamekeeper's thumb, each treated in a different fashion. Um, I'd like to tell you that we're going to look at associated fractures of the proximal phalanx with the tear. I'd like to look at the stenter lesion. You've heard a lot about it, so I'll be brief, but it's so important. Residual subluxation of the uh, proximal phalanx after post-reconstruction. And as was Jerry said at the outset, the superficial radial nerve neuropraxia or a neurotmesis, very concerning, obviously. So let's dig in. Here's the 47-year-old baseball player injures his glove 24 hours ago, attempting to tag the base runner at second. Immediate pain and swelling ecchymosis over the left thumb, over the left MP of the thumb. Range of motion shows a little decreased range of motion, but remember the MP joint is very different. I live life, I hope you can see it, that I get to the other side of my hand by bending my uh, MP joint and my IP joint, and some people need only the IP joint and the MP, so be careful when you see decreased range of motion, may not be always true, decreased strength, tenderness at the base as the arrow shows, and Dean Lewis helped us a long time ago with about stability testing, looking at zero to 30 degrees, no opening, We'll talk about that. And if we see abnormal at 30 degrees or more than absolute 35 degrees or asymmetric to the other side, we start to worry about it. So this didn't happen with this patient. I show you this because for me, and I'd love my colleagues to talk about it, you always want for me that true lateral in the middle. And why I say that is if you have volar subluxation of the proximal phalanx of P1, that is almost pathognomonic for me of an older collateral ligament injury. And so if you can look at that or take home one pearl from my talk, that's it. And you know that you have something. So there is something going on there because it's not collinear with the metacarpal if you have a very good film. Here you can see what I'm talking about. There is also on the x-ray that Phalanx fracture seeing on the volar aspect, pretty much non-displaced. 
So I wanted to start easy because we have one of the best therapists going to help us today. Here's some stress rules and extension, really not bad. If it was if it was abnormal on the left, you'd see that as we saw from other talks, but this is what happened when we stressed this patient. So it really doesn't open up. Because I live in New York City, there isn't a person that gets an MRI, we'll talk about it right or wrong, so they all come in ahead of time from other doctors, so be it. But here you can see a non-displaced fracture at the base of the proximal phalanx, a bone contusion, and really no big injuries of that on the collateral ligament and radial collateral ligament. So the question is, as we heard, are we going to risk stiffness by not operating or cause stiffness by operating? Are we going to cause loss of motion by operating, infection, superficial radial nerve, or time away uh, from sport or other issues? And so that's concerning. Here you can see we chose non-operative treatment, and I leave this because I'm going to go to operative complications after this. And what I wanted to say is you can see the orthoplast splint. You can see the short gauntlet that we like to make, um, spica. And we can see the outcome was terrific and returned to play with no injuries. And so I'll leave that for our therapist because we have some great comments. So let's dig in to know that, yes, when you have an avulsion fracture, conservative treatment seems to work in a thumb spike of splint. It's seen in the literature by others. There is a non-union rate. It depends on the piece. I think you'd be very careful. We can talk about it. But conservative treatment can be a good option when, in fact, you know that the ligament is not injured. But how about this? A complex fracture with a stenter lesion. 21-year-old flag football player lands on a dominant hand, loves act actually sports, pain and swelling over the MP joint of the left thumb, noted lump on the uh, physical exam, and you can see at the MP joint, opens at zero degrees, opens at 30 degrees, asymmetric to the other side. I bring you to the literature a long time ago. I'm showing my age because most of the time things are in the literature and we just try to repeat it. So don't repeat history. Someone very smart, smarter than I'll ever be, Abramson did a series out of Sweden. And he said with his group, if you see this lump, you're done. You know you have a standard lesion. And he was able to predict it with a positive predictive value. And so I'm telling you, Beware when you see it, you know you're in trouble and you need to wake up. Here are the x-rays. If you look very carefully, yes, there's a proximal phalanx fracture, it's small, but what about that asymmetry there on the lateral? There's the volar subluxation of P1 and you need to be able to take care of that for the proximal phalanx. And yes, the question is, did the ligament stay to the proximal phalanx or is the ligament separated? And as you know, suspicious as we were from the physical exam of having a stenter lesion. Well, this is where people sometimes get MRIs. And I want to teach you that I want you to help me to help your radiologist. So this would be a classic radiologist sending you, oh, I know it's a full thickness tear, the only collateral ligament, distal insertion is torn. Note the retraction that you see. But I don't know for sure if that's a stenter lesion, even though the radiologist may say so. So what I encourage you to do, and we've published on this, and I'm um, sorry, the reference isn't there and I can get it. This is the axial view that you need to get, in my opinion. Do you see the residual problem? That little bump and lump is the only collateral ligament outside of the adductor. And so I encourage you to get these axial images. It guides your surgical treatment that you so well heard from Dr. Hunt. So here again, a minimally displaced fracture in review, the base of the proximal phalanx, the dorsal on the side at the insertion, a torn on the collateral ligament where the radiologist says, clearly this is stenter and I just don't buy it. I really want those axials. And I encourage again, axial imaging to guide your surgical treatment. It's in a long article uh, in MRI imaging that we did publish. Here it is. That's that image that you want to see and you can be comfortable that you know you must go to the operating room and fix this. So here's our patient under stress.
clearly there's something happening confirming only collateral ligament tears. But don't forget that sometimes people can have big injuries. This is an ulnar collateral ligament on the left, but this stress view is to look at the radial collateral ligament. Now, if you have an MRI, you probably can get the answer, but if you don't, you can have big injuries and you don't want to miss the radial collateral ligament. Today is a talk about ulnar collateral ligaments. And funny enough, I come from New York City. It's called the doorman's injury because the doorman in New York City would push the door for all the people on Park Avenue and tear their radial collateral ligament. So are you lost and confused? No. Be definitive. I think that's the biggest thing I see in training fellows these days. Be definitive. Understand the facts and be good and calm and tell the patient why you need to go to the operating room for surgical treatment. So we're going. So here's some artwork to show what Tom was showing so excellent. Here you can see in the top, we'll talk about the superficial radial nerve, but here as you travel along, and you can see if I point to the superficial radial nerve, we're going to come and actually a little out of order, we're going to identify the um, ligament sitting on top of the pink here in the middle section of the stenter lesion. We can roughen it up with a curette or a burr. We can drill a hole with an anchor. We can place it in place, as you can see then to the far left, and repair the adductor, as you see. And on the far right, that relationship that you want to avoid. So just like Tom showed, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, it's great. Here you can see where we're going in to identify the superficial radial nerve. Be very careful. Identify that center lesion. See how the adductor is intact so that we're going to cut it, replacing a freer type instrument right there. We leave it so we can repair it. And then of course, we're gonna use the appropriate instrumentation to then place a hole, sutures, imbricate, and sew as we do that. And that's really uh, what it's all about to get a great repair at the end. Here again, you can see the placement. We don't wanna be in the joint. And this is what we want to avoid. If you take a look up top, here was the volar subluxation. And here on the far right, the collinear relationship between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx, well reduced, knowing we have it in place. There you go. So in the journal here, not a lot of great articles. And I realize maybe it's time to rewrite some articles, but here the acute versus chronic these authors saying high yield and satisfaction with thumb strength and function, but they didn't really look at, is it local soft tissue advancement that they have to do and separate out that from suture anchor or some of the great ideas that Dr. Hunt shared today? <clears throat> and does it make any difference in using imprecation and then overlays and suture tape and other things to help us? Here with athletes, again, a high return to rate following surgical intervention, but really didn't say it, but the complications can occur. And it was pain, numbness, weakness, decreased range of motion, and failed repair, which we'll talk about at 10.3. And for me, that, that's a little too high. And so we all have to do a better job, but return to play at 96%. I wonder when they went to return to play. That's what I wanted to see. And they didn't say, and I suspect it was a little early. How about the superficial radial nerve? You heard it in the first talk, so important to identify. Incidence here, 6.5%, numbness to the distal part of the incision. I'm sorry, meticulous surgical technique. The difficulty is we don't police ourselves. We don't train ourselves. I think as hand surgeons specialized, we are there. But this operation is done by many people and of different specialties. And so we all owe it to help each other to really work on this so that we don't have permanent numbness. We don't have problems. Difficult. The superficial radial nerve is difficult at the wrist. It's just as difficult on the thumb as well, as you've heard. Sometimes the neuropraxia takes three to four months to resolve, and one hopes, but we need to be gentle and identify. How about managing persistent instability? This is why I think being aggressive is important. People think, oh, it's just an ulnar collateral ligament. I will tell you, in my hands, 
it is difficult for me to get a great result with a chronic tear. And I think we can get an outstanding result in fixing an acute tear. And 15% of all grade three injuries have this conservative treatment. And that's not good. This a young lady, or she's not so young, has no ability to grab that pen as she can't because of the instability that's remnant at her own collateral ligament. And yeah, maybe we can fuse and maybe we can do other things, but do we have to do that and miss that opportunity that we could have fixed an acute tear and it was really easy enough? So I leave you with a thought that good things can happen if we work together. People who know me know that it's important that we work together. This is a picture of my daughter uh, when she was four years old. Who knows what was in her mush brain that she decided to hug this other child with this bathing suit that maybe looks similar for her. She didn't know her. And I tell you that if we help each other and we work together with each other, I think good things can happen. And that's the beautiful part about the AO Foundation and their education platform as we all help each other. And so I say thank you. Remember that these people is a real picture. It took this long for these two individuals on both sides of the bridge to realize that this bridge would never meet. I hope we're a lot smarter as we figure out how to help our patients. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. That was a great talk by Dr. Blanchard. Um, so we'll discuss some of the complications a little bit more detail in the Q&A. So one of the questions that came up is how do you salvage a failed repair with the different techniques of internal bracing, suture anchor, push lock, swivel lock? I want to make sure I give Kim enough time. So right after Kim's talk, we'll kind of dive right into that right away. And really want to uh, thank Kim for joining the panel today. As I tell every patient, the therapist make us look good. So whether it's a complication or a home run, uh, I think we really count on our therapist colleagues to make our patients do well and look good. So thank you, Kim. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and just want to share that um, I'm kind of a, a step in. I'm stepping in for a colleague of mine, Mo Herman, who um, is the hand therapist for the LA Lakers. The, the Lakers... Um, as some of you may know, made it to the West Finals tonight. And so she was unable to be with us, um, but she was kind enough to share her talk. And I'm going to, um, we've known each other for 22 years. We met online studying for the hand therapy exam. So I hope to uh, share her work with you tonight. I have no disclosures and I, I want to start by reflecting what my colleagues have shared tonight, the importance of teamwork, collaboration, and communication. I'm going to be focusing more on the athlete and rehab after the internal brace procedure. And uh, it's really a triad effort. We can't get through this without the therapist, physician, and the athlete all being on the same page. So first, I want to go back in history a little bit, looking at return to sports uh, with traditional thumb MP UCL repairs. And the earliest we returned people to sports was 10 to 12 weeks before. And many physicians I worked with would say 16 weeks. Uh, with immobilization for up to six weeks, uh, range of motion only from four to eight weeks, and, and strengthening not really beginning until six to 12 weeks. So in 2016, uh, you heard a, a little bit about Dr. Steve Shin. Uh, as you know, he has been instrumental in the internal brace uh, publications literature and worked collaboratively with Mo Herman in developing a advanced rehab timeline following uh, the use of internal bracing. Uh, so in 2016, that's when they started and spent three years kind of outlining how they could continue to advance uh, post-operative care. So rather than 10 to 12 or 12 to 16 weeks, they um, by 2019, we're taking athletes um, back to play between six and eight weeks um, and starting range of motion as early as seven days and strengthening as early as two to three weeks. So a couple years later, they did a retrospective review of all of their athletes and realized that they could accelerate that timeline 
even further. And so now rather than six to, we've went, gone from 10 to 12 to six to eight, and now we're at five to six weeks returning to sport um, and mobilizing for two to three days in that post-operative cast. We do go ahead and fabricate um, at two to three days that hand-based thumb spica, um, but start range of motion right away outside of the orthosis. And um, by between the first and second week, we're making a very small custom sport orthosis and starting sport specific skills. Um, and again, returning to, to full sports by five to six weeks. So uh, continued refinement this past year in 2022, they um, advanced this, uh, pro this uh, guideline even further. And this was a case series specifically for professional baseball basketball players. And this is the same uh, rehab timeline that you saw previously, but with a little bit more detail. So um, adding in some of that non-contact versus contact sport specific skills. And um, although returning to sports at five to six weeks still um, with the sport orthosis as needed, still some continued rehabilitation needs uh, for a few more weeks after they return to sport as well. So I'm going to go through those steps um, in a graded fashion for you to talk through uh, what we do at each one of those phases to do this accelerated guideline. And again, keep in mind that these are professional athletes that are going to be in the clinic um, every day for long periods of time with quite a lot of motivation to get back to their sport. So step one uh, happens the day of surgery. Uh, it's that phone call with our collaborative physician. So we're kind of in the dyad, not necessarily the triad right now, because we want to know uh, how did the surgery go? Were there complications? Is there anything I should know as a hand therapist? Is there any concern for infection? When can I remove those post-op dressings? Uh, when can I fabricate the custom orthosis? Can I do that at day two or three? Uh, can I start active range of motion right away? How about passive? When can I start upper body strengthening? And when can we transition from that hand-based orthosis to the sport orthosis. And so that's really um, day zero. Once my athletes come to the clinic and we've had a couple of visits, um, my athlete's going to help define that second phone call. And now we're, we're, we're that triad. Now it's the uh, athlete working with me, telling me what questions I need to ask the surgeon, um, understanding their sport, understanding exactly what they want to get back to from their activity, um, so after two or three visits with my athlete, I'm going to call the surgeon again and start asking about return to competition, discharging the sport orthosis. When can I integrate with the team, non-contact versus contact? When can I throw, catch, pass, dribble, whatever their sport is? Again, engaging the athlete in timelines. They're going to be very motivated to get back to their sport. So we, we pull out a calendar and we write down every game for the season. We write down the goals that they're uh, trying to achieve. And we put that, that advanced rehab guideline throughout the weeks uh, to keep them motivated and pull it out at every visit uh, to keep them uh, motivated and on time. We want to keep going, going, going. So here we are just two to three days post-op. Uh, with physician clearance, we're going to remove that post-operative cast, perform wound care, make that custom hand-based orthosis, and begin active and passive range of motion. Just an important note to stay focused on uh, thumb MP extension, especially with basketball players. Um, I've rehabbed quite a few non-athletes, and uh, one thing that's often lost is MP extension. Uh, patients are... Uh, you know, are, are immobilized in an MCP flexed position often. And the focus is usually MP flexion, uh, but MP extension also important. Uh, this is just a continuation of, of how do we do active range of motion. And again, keeping your athlete or patient motivated through activity um, and, and challenging them for active range of motion in various ways. So now we're seven to 10 days post-op. So this is when we want to start proximal strengthening. And so 
how do you do uh, proximal strengthening without um, having excessive force or grip on the thumb? Uh, we use balls, so you have a palmer grip. Uh, it also is motivating usually for the the athlete who plays a ball sport, such as a basketball player. Always want to emphasize bilateral and to look at shoulder elbow form wrist strength. Now we're getting a little further along. We're one to two, two weeks post-op. We're going to start some gentle grip and pinch strengthening. We want to be really careful with that lateral stress. So of course, uh, not stressing that ECL repair. Uh, we also have learned that forceful opposition can uh, increase soft tissue reactions and swelling. So be careful with forceful opposition at this stage. In addition, this is uh, again with uh, physician clearance, surgeon clearance, we're gonna transition to that custom sport orthosis and out of that hand-based thumb spica where there's no sensory input because you've got all that plastic material in the palm. We make these uh, very much favoring the radial side of the thumb and might have uh, various uh, coverings under or over depending on the condition of the wound. Uh, but this allows the sensory input on the volar surface of the thumb to hold their, their ball or whatever sport uh, you, uh, equipment that they utilize, um, but ensuring protection at the same time. These uh, orthoses sometimes can uh, be a bit of an art. You kind of have to do trial and error until you get the, the right support, but also maximize the sensory feel. Um, we're going to start doing some graded sport-specific skills, but only in the therapy clinic uh, with the sport orthosis on where we go ahead and get whatever um, sport that they're in, whether it's hockey, football, or basketball, use different size balls or sticks, uh, depending on your athlete, to start grading them back to their sport. Moving on, now we're two to three weeks post-operative. We're going to continue with motion strength and those sports sub skills in the clinic, um, you know, focusing on uh, opposition, extension, strength of the thumb, and tailoring all of the activities that you do to the sport to keep that athlete engaged and motivated. Three weeks post op, this is important to get your physician in communication and get clearance as you start doing non contact sports, often outside of the therapy clinic and back to where they perform their sports. Um, you'll have the sport orthosis on, but starting to practice their sport. Again, um, with physician communication and clearance, at four weeks, we're gonna start with graded contact. So again, important to have that activity analysis where, analysis where you grade the activity. So you might start with just hand contact while dribbling. Uh, and then eventually some one-on-one -on -one physical body contact before you have full team sports. And, and often we're there just coaching um, a teammate or an athletic trainer so that they can continue to support these efforts when you're not there. Five to six weeks post-op. This is where we're talking about returning to competition with that sport orthosis on. And then six to eight weeks um, we're going to continue traditional rehab and address some of those soft tissue issues that occur as soon as they return to sports uh, and assuming at eight weeks they're fully back to their pre-surgery status, we would discharge them to a home program. But as uh, we talked earlier, can we return to sports even faster than five to six weeks? And the answer is yes, we can. So here's three different Laker players that Mo worked with, um, operated on by Dr. Shin, uh, who did return to competition, one on day 33, and our other two were only a day apart because their surgeries were a day apart. But again, just to reiterate the importance of teamwork and that this is a triad between the therapist, the athlete, and the physician, um, important communication and collaboration really need to understand that athlete and the inherent pressure that they have both internally and externally to return to play. Um, that orthosis fabrication and the problem solving that's involved. And then looking at those sport specific timelines and really tailoring your rehab to the sport that they play. 
And you, so you, you end up having to really make over your therapy clinic to turn it into, turn the sport into a treatment modality. And just again, want to thank Mo Herman for helping to develop the content and sharing her wisdom and knowledge with us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Kim. That's a great talk. Thank you so much for stepping in and kind of using those slides to give you the talk as well. Thank you so much. Um, actually, kind of just coming off the therapy talk, kind of curious at your own experience. Also, Dr. Hunt, I know, works with quite a few athletes. What's your timeline that you're comfortable with? Is it six weeks? Is this your kind of timeline? Or do you feel like, certainly with Dr. Shin and Mo, they have a lot of experience. Pro players, they could push the kind of the... Uh, envelope a little bit in terms of how much to really push as far as return to play. Is that kind of time like you guys follow your own practices as far as that four to six weeks and six to eight week recover return period? Well, I'll comment first. I, I think most of most of the discussion was around the NBA players around basketball because it's so dependent on sport, position, time in the season. I mean, there are just so many factors, as Kim knows. Um, if it's a basketball player, yeah, that's typically what I would use too. Football is too, is often much faster than that, depending on the position. I mean, I showed that I showed Drew Brees that um, they had operated on as well, and I think he missed two games, maybe three, but I think two games, and then played with that small um, the radial gutter splint on. Um, I call it a half pipe splint, but. Um, you know, I think it's very similar. So I think we're all on the same page with that. And there's really, you know, once the wound's healed and you feel like you have the stability from your internal brace and, and you feel really comfortable with your ligamentous uh, repair as well, I don't I don't think there's a reason you can't progress. Kim, are there any milestones you use for range of motion or grip strength before you, you feel comfortable releasing them from your care and also return to play? Yeah, great question. Uh, so Mo was actually Drew Brees' hand therapist as well, and she did have him back on the field, I believe, between uh, three and four weeks. Uh, she's done a full presentation just on him as a case study, so it was interesting. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's more about the reaction of the soft tissue than the actual strength and range of motion. Um, because if they're having um, increased pain and swelling, that tells me that there's something wrong. And that's when I want to, you know, call the physician and say, maybe we need to pull back a little bit. Usually range of motion, because we start so early, it's just not, not, it's kind of a non-issue and strength tends to just return as pain goes away. Uh, so I, again, I look more for the reaction of the soft tissues. Perfect. Great. So I'm going to go to a case right now. And from that, I'm actually go to Dr. Plancher and Dr. Hanna, how you manage Kind of a failed repair and also if you're doing push lock or swivel lock once you committed to a technique you know you have a bone tunnel there what do you do i'm gonna have you guys touch on that so i know about both dr hunt and dr plancha talked about a lot easier to do these acutely than a chronic instability case uh where there might be chronic attrition not a lot of tissue to work with this is a patient of my 53 year old instability for about two years denies any trauma came in a pretty significant disability can't really pinch, can't twist open a jar, gross deformity over the right thumb with radial subluxation of the joint, hyperextension instability. She is passively reducible, no arthritic changes, kind of talked about everything. She really wanted to try and retain her motion overall as much as possible, despite this being a chronic injury. Talked about repair versus recon versus MCP fusion. In Tropoli, felt like the repair was quite good. It felt like there's stout tissue enough to repair her. Two weeks post, obviously, she's translated radially. And six weeks out, she's completely now sublux, kind of going back to almost baseline. So I'm going to start with uh, maybe Kevin. So intraoperatively, you do repair. Let's say you're doing a push lock or a swivel lock, or maybe a patient that's already had prior surgery. What's your salvage for somebody who's had prior surgery? Well, I'm very happy that she was on the other side of the United States. Um, <laughs> This is a very hard problem. Chronic, I want to first say, is what we hopefully avoid because I believe it's not the best answer. So in answering you, um, I am an old-fashioned gentleman that does a box stitch. So I would see first of, ahead of time if someone has a palmaris always before going in on a chronic case. Um, 
And if in fact I have a palmaris, I have not had success restoring like this, the tissue has just been inadequate. I'm going to listen to Tom and some of the companies that provide other materials that aren't human, but I literally go around and they make certain old fashioned rotator cuff curvature things that can go through the holes and come out the other side um, and literally make a box stitch if she doesn't want that MCP fusion. That for me has been the go-to because I want to secure it on the radial side, kind of a buttress, because that's what happened, as well as come around and tie it on the ulna side. And so I know Steve and others have done that, but that's it. And I would also warn the individual that they are going to be stiff. They may have asymmetric motion. And I think it's always important to document how does someone get, I said it, to the other side of their hand? Do they use the IP joint? Do they use the MP joint? Because we're all different. And so they, the person may say, look how stiff I am. And it turns out it's a perfect result because they never really had a lot of MP range of motion. They have zero to 10 degrees and they do everything through their IP joint. So I, I, I throw that out there as an albatross, as a way from the old ways to do it. Is there a role for a revision surgery, Kevin, in your mind? So this patient's failed. Um, would you even try it? Do you feel like once they fail, like say you could get by with really good IP motion, would you even offer revision? Would you go, would you say, look, it's MP fusion or accepting the deformity you have right now? So I think relationships are very important as I got older. I don't know that I did it as well when I was young. So I want to say forming a relationship whenever you have a complication is the most important thing. You want to get as close as possible to the patient and use the words, I'm really sorry. I tried and it didn't work. Whether it's the patient's fault or not, you have to own it, in my opinion. And so I... I would say to you, because the joint looks really great, I don't know the patient and I didn't see the age as well of the patient, but I suspect they're young. I don't know. Um, I would maybe try what I said before going to the MCP and explain the difference to the, the, two, the two alternatives. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, Tom, so your thoughts, you talked about kind of the, your progression, the protocol key repair, internal bracing, and then internal bracing, there's certainly different tools you have for that, whether it's a push lock, a swivel lock, different techniques. What's your kind of salvage? Once you've done one procedure, what's your salvage for a redo? Well, so I, I think just kind of going back to this this patient, I think she was about 52, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, my decision at that time would have been highly dependent on what kind of ligamentous tissue she had, you know? could I recreate a, a retracted ligament and make something that was functional? If I, if I could, and I felt good about that, I would repair it in the way you did. And I would add an internal brace because in the chronic situation, I know where the joint wants to go and it's not straight ahead. It wants to tilt to the side. So I feel like I need to do something more. If instead I was in that situation and I, and I didn't feel very confident in the tissue at all, then I do a Steve Glickel kind of, you know, bone, tu bone tunnel uh, procedure that we, we all described. And depending on how I felt at that point, I might or might not put an internal brace over the top. I probably wouldn't in somebody like her. Um, so does that answer your question, Jerry? Yeah, that's great. So the I guess the other part, going back to the uh, attendee's question, Let's say you've done internal bracing. So now you have a push lock or maybe a swivel lock or some type of suture anchor, both at the base of the proximal phalanx and also the metacarpal head. If you now have to do a revision, how do you address the revision now with a implant that's in there right now? Drill through it. <laughs> well, I'll, do. Uh, I'll hear what Tom says. I'm going to say what Tom says. That's the beauty of the non metal. If it's, you know, as uh, you take a drill and you go right through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll answer that, Jerry. And, and first, I didn't mention when I would use a swivel lock and when I would use a push lock. And and it really depends on size. Like the, the swivel lock that I like is 3.5 millimeters. I think the smaller swivel lock is very hard to utilize effectively in my hands. So when I want something smaller, I tend to use a push lock. 
And that case that I showed also about a 52 year old woman tennis player who had that internal brace placed and had her all her ligament taken out and just non leg graft. And that situation, I felt like I had to get that previous internal brace out of there. And so I, I took everything out. And then I was left with big holes, both in the metacarpal and in the proximal phalanx. And, and I also really didn't want to put, I didn't want to uh, take a palmaris longus graft on her. I, I think it was because she didn't have one, but I just didn't feel like that was the right approach for this particular person. So what I did is I actually um, put a, an all suture, um, the, that what's it called? The um, all suture lock kind of thing, the arthrex thing through that metacarpal previously made whole first and out the radial cortex and then tensioned it on that cortex without making an incision over the radial side. Then I put in this, the standard, um, um, the standard swivel lock in that hole, which made it all tighter and then put the standard swivel lock back in the proximal phalanx hole and drill the second hole just dorsal to at about the level of the equator and put a push lock in that and use all suture and suture tape, no biological tissue. And it, like you saw in those pictures, it worked beautifully. And I was very fortunate that it did um, because, I mean, honestly, I'm a big believer in um, – if you're treating human injury, it really requires effective biological solutions to work long term. I think this new technology we have and some of these great advances are there to support our approach from a biological perspective, not to throw out the that concept. So that's my general bent. No, I, I certainly agree with you. I think some of the internal bracing, I think it's the great kind of support almost a strut to support and protect you to repair but i think some type of biology has to be there for that to really work so whether you do a tendon graft or a key repair but i think the internal bracing certainly makes the rehab a lot faster it makes it easier but i think biology is really important yeah. so a question for you kim and actually for the faculty let's say you catch this patient at two weeks post-op you can see it starting to open up ownerly uh from a therapy perspective are there any kind of any stabilization techniques any orthosis that you would apply early on, Kim, to try and hopefully avoid revision surgery? Yeah, thank you for asking. I would go in the completely opposite direction as the previous patients I was sharing. So I would probably do a forearm-based um, thumb spica, and I would minimize the um, abduction. So I would put, place the thumb in adduction and actually kind of pull them in uh, an ulnar position to put some slack on that joint. Um, so they're, you know, kind of, uh, they, we usually want to preserve the web space, but I would close the web space a little bit. Okay, great. This is going to touch on some of the things that were discussed. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly to respectfully everybody's time that joined us for this afternoon, this evening. This is a 66 year old injury, actually acute injury, severe pain, deformity, owner laxity. So actually intrab, this was a missed substance tear. Uh, so I actually took what I can, repaired it, and didn't think it was good enough. So augmented with suture tape, and the thought was to do kind of a swivel lock anchor on both sides. So for the, you know, those that use this technique, there are two different drills, a silver and a gold. I had to do silver in general, it's a smaller drill, make sure I don't blow that tunnel so it's too big to get a tight fit. But intra, as I kind of put the drill in there and put the swivel lock, there's no bite. The bone was so osteopenic that even go by going a smaller drill, I couldn't get any purchase whatsoever. So now I'm in the OR. I'm planning to do a, you know, some type of acute repair. So how do you salvage this? I know we kind of touched upon this earlier, both uh, Dr. Plancher, Dr. Hunt. So what do you do when you now have this bone tunnel? And Kevin, your thoughts? I want to play old again. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm loving this. So... I don't own anything, so I want to say, first of all, there are two other companies that make things that will allow you sometimes to do it. One, um, with the capital C, um, they have a much smaller anchor uh, that's there uh, as this size, so you don't get into trouble with the tunnel. And two, 
When I started this, all we had was, um, and again, I'll say a G2, a metal, small, very little anchor. Um, 1995 for the Academy, there's a video, you can look it up. And I think we need metal in uh, this case to rectify this. I understand you're going to worry about now this fiber tape, but I'm going to try to abandon this if it's really pulling out. Um, but I have to figure out a way to grab the bone. And I think the small metal with the little prongs will salvage this. Great. Tom, thoughts? Yeah. Was it pulling out proximally and distally or just one or the other? Uh, it was the metacarpal head was just nothing okay. there. Just kind of can't sell us bone. Well, so number one, I really like Kevin's idea. I mean, I think, you know, right, finding something, you know, that has prongs and spreads out, that makes total sense to me. I love, I love the, the concept. If you're trying to use some other materials, you could use, like I did previously, that all suture anchor um, and drill it through the fit, through the radial cortex of the distal thumb metacarpal and, and grab that. That would do the trick and then then put it in distally in the in the proximal phalanx. So I think either one or maybe both. <laughs> yeah, so this one actually uh, kind of kind of like you talked about earlier, Kevin, a little bit, you pass the tendon through, kind of mm -hmm. bone tunnels actually pass it out radially. Now you actually tie your suture on the other side. So that's how I kind of end up salvaging this kind of big bone tunnels, get biology in there. And you could just either tie on the other side with kind of traditional buttons, or you could do a tenodesis screw. So this is how I interoperably salvage this one. That was great. That's a little old technology uh, does a, a long way sometimes. Got to get creative. That's why. And, and I think also it's humbling because it, it shows you, you know, you really have to put, it's not just, oh, I'm going to throw in a, a skier's thumb and no sweat. These, these can be tricky. Yeah, these are fun cases. And when it goes well, it's a quick case, but these can be challenging for sure. Well, it's now 7.20 on the East Coast. want to respect everybody's time. So really appreciate the three of you joining us uh, for this evening. Uh, great discussion, great lectures. And also, again, thank uh, our organizers, uh, Chris O'Reilly and Abby's with us kind of on the IT side and coordinating everything for us. And Dr. Rizzo for all his work behind the scenes as the chair of the AO North America Hand Education Committee. Uh, thank you for joining us. And the talks will be uh, emailed to you as far as the link, um, as well as the CME as well. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Any thank thoughts? you. Yeah, any last comments or thoughts, uh, Dr. Rizzo? Or I think otherwise, we're going to let folks get back to their evening with their families. Uh, thank you very much. Outstanding session, guys. And um, again, thank you as well. And um, uh, boy, a lot there and it's a uh, it's a high stress uh, type situation with these athletes getting them back as soon as you can and trying to walk that line um i can't thank you all enough for an outstanding session it was great and uh, i appreciate all your hard work and dedication we love you marco have a good night thank you marco time. i'm a laker fan so go lakers go lakers <laughs> take care all right good... thank you guys Recording stopped. All right. All right. Have a good evening, guys. I'll uh, talk to you guys good later. Night. Thank you so much. All right. Okay.